Hello and welcome to the Whiz Bang Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Goodall. We're going to be talking to musicians. We're going to be talking to people in the music business, music managers. We're going to be talking to friends of mine. It's a casual and hopefully informative podcast with, uh, you know, jammers. Our guest today is a bassist, a singer-songwriter, recording and touring musician, overall mensch. Please welcome to the podcast, Craig Berletic. What's up, Brad? Thank you for having me, man. Of course. Welcome to the podcast. How are you? Doing good, man. Good. How about man, you? I'm doing all right, man. I'm hosting a podcast. It couldn't be that bad for me, right? It's going all right. Did you touch the instrument today? Did you play any bass today? A little bit, man. Yeah, I, I kind of have an acoustic electric bass. It's kind of mo- my morning routine. Right. Hang out, play a few notes. Tell me about this morning routine. How long are you playing in the mornings? Because I, I didn't play today. I'm not, I'm not judging you no matter what. I'm just, I'm just asking, what would you play today? Well, I've been working on a bass arrangement of a Joni Mitchell song. It's kind of inspired by the Willie Nelson version that's on both sides now. Very cool. But yeah, like morning routine, uh, you know, over this whole break, uh, me and my wife had a child, our first child. Congratulations. Thank you, man. So that's kind of been my morning routine. Get up and, uh, you little, know. A little ch- coffee. Like change a diaper, get the coffee going, get a <laughs> bottle warming. We've been, uh, me and him been watching all the classic albums on Amazon Prime. Wow. They're all on Amazon Prime? Not all of them. Like Almost all of them. The Marvin Gaye one's not on there. Stevie Wonder's not on there. Okay, I haven't, most, I haven't seen the Marvin Gaye classic albums, but I need which which album is it for? I think it's what's going on. Yeah, of course, yeah. Once I be. got about halfway through them, I was like, all right, I'm gonna get through all of these, and like looked up the list, and most of them were on there. So I love those documentaries, man. The Steely Dan one I can recite basically note for note, and the funniest part about the Steely Dan uh, classic album DVD is. Uh, I had a partition. It was about here or here. Name the bass player. Chuck Rainey. Chuck Rainey. One of the greats, hands One, down, yeah. Right, and he's talking about playing, he's talking about thumbing a bridge on Peg, I think it is. Yeah, well, they, uh, the, his version of the story is that they didn't want slap bass because slap bass was kind of popular at the time. And uh, <laughs> him being a man of taste, you know. He just, said, I'm going to get my parts off. He said, well, the song needed it, right? It wasn't. Right. He was like, it just needed that. So right. did it on the sly a little bit. And right. And it's very proud of the fact that they love the line. And uh, they didn't notice, Weren't though. the wiser, no. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the, the the duo, of Steely Dan, they didn't notice that he did change the part on against their liking or willing or whatever it was, and he still got a lot. Do you ever feel like... Do you sneak stuff in? Like it's like I know no one no one might notice what I'm about to do on this bass, but I'm still gonna put something in there. Uh, I I don't try to feel about it as sneaking. I think that I try to trust to play. Like when you play bass, there is a um you know, most of the people in the world are guitar players, right? When especially in a scene yeah. like this. So there's a lot of opinions that are like what bass players should and shouldn't play. And you know, as a bass player I do love the role playing aspect of playing bass sure but there is the you play on somebody's two and you don't want to play too much but it, yeah. you do have to be an artist and pull a thread as yeah. far as what feels right and sometimes you're pulling that thread and you're going on up into what uh jeter calls the dusty bits the dusty bits of the guitar the notes that are are rarely played especially on the bass you know this is <laughs> yeah this is your, past that like maybe eighth fret yeah get a little trivial up there I, love, I mean i love that range i i feel like you know I've tried to look at the bass like that's if you think about it objectively and not as a role playing instrument, the notes sound very nice up there. Of course. And that's yeah. actually the part of the bass that you can play more than one note and yeah. get, you know, a yeah. chord and some really interesting sounds. Yeah, because we play together and even just recently where it's like if if it's just you playing and you are able to build get up there a little bit in the dusty bits, quote unquote, and start playing chords, it kinda is its standalone instrument. The bass when done um with some technique and with some touch and with some uh range is it can be a standalone instrument yeah it's i think right there with piano it's the mixture of rhythm and melody you know like the instrument is that's what its purpose is and you got to use your own judgment and like you know your own taste and the history the history of the instrument and what's been done and follow your own heart and kind of figure out your own way, you know? Right. Speaking of the history of the instrument, I want to know everybody who has, everybody who plays an instrument has like a guy where it's just like, that's my guy. I've, that's my earliest influence. That's the person who I respect the most, or maybe 
stole the most licks off of or whatever. Who's Craig Berletic's guy? Man, for those examples you gave, it's almost going to be different people for one of those things because like, I've thought about this a lot because I've never really felt attached to bass players. Like, Even you know, as you get into the instrument, you're in high school, you're playing a little bit. It's like I get Bass Player Magazine, you read some things. It's like, <laughs> I, when I, like a lot of people we interview, it's like, first thing I listen to is the bass. When I hear any song, I don't care what it is. I, hear the, I don't like that attitude, though. But I mean, like some people with any instrument there is. Like, I think right. you could hear the same thing about you know drummers or something it's like i zone in on that but like i think my real love was like material like i really love a good song that's what i mean and like and i think the bass does lend itself like as the bass player but that rule plan i was talking about i can just play the song like it doesn't if if i'm not noticed you know especially on a great song it's like that's what i love to do yeah. so but i did in exploring the bass in my later years kind of find some bass players I enjoy and, right. I, and like if I have to pick a couple you know I'd have to mention Ray Brown the upright bass player was like famous for playing with Oscar Peterson trio as far as just jazz legend quality of tone the melody you know he really could hold his own with melodic ideas with Oscar Peterson yeah virtuoso who piano was playing player. a lot of piano and just and not only was Oscar Peterson's melodic ideas good the way they sounded the you know the actual the swing of it. Yeah, yeah, just the quality of tone, you know, so. And then, I'm, I, you know, I mainly play electric bass. I love the upright bass, but um, James Jamerson is somebody, every bass player. And with him, it's kind of hard to say what about his playing has made him the guy, you know, but it's, there's a sense of melody there, It and it, it changes. Like, he doesn't just play the same thing. Like, it's this. There's a linear sense to his bass lines through a tune, makes it feel composed all the way through yeah, it. Like that's little, nice. little subtle changes. Yeah. And then, you know, his tone of that classic P bass sound. Yeah. You know, I mean, and it's just, I don't know, it's something to, um, it's kind of crazy. He was one of the electric bass was just coming around at that time and he's still one of the greats. And right. The, and then, you know, there's obviously Jocko Pastorius, who's kind of like the Eddie Van Halen of bass, <laughs> but he really did legitimize electric bass in the intellectual World. instrumental music. Yeah. You know, of so like early on, especially people who played what is known as jazz by some people. Yeah. You know, you had the upright players, you had the Fender bass players, and it was a separate thing. Yeah. So, you know, Jocko came around and actually gave some legitimacy to what the bass could do. And, harmonics and chords and so it's like and it took me i wasn't crazy about like jocko and victor Woot when i first got into it all this choppy acrobatic stuff but mm -hmm. um yeah so there's certain recordings that sometimes it just clicks and i saw a jocko one eventually it's like it's about groove and feel and yeah you know it was an interesting sound for the time as well yeah when that stuff clicks it you can kind of tell that it's like i'm going to be listening to this guy for a long time yeah you, man. that stuff kind of gets in there and it's like this is going to be something i use as a reference for my own musicianship, my own musicality for a long time. Well, as far as influences, you picked some pretty good ones. Those are some great, I mean, like legends, really. Um, tell me about your role now playing with Rodney Elkins, uh, your old buddy, playing uh, in the rhythm section for Tyler Childers. How do you feel about, like, what's going through your mind, you know, on song five, playing with him at a, at a show, any old show? Yeah, what's man. happening there between you two? Like, I think if you say what's happening in my mind, I just imagine looking at Rod and saying, "Feels great, baby." <laughs> that's uh, that's kind of like our Love thing. It. Like, I try yeah. to, uh, man. I think about every show with Tyler. I'm like I said about material. I'm very, very fortunate to play classic, timeless material with a guy. That's like, I've always wanted to try to write a good song for myself, man. And I remember the first few times hearing Tyler play, it's like, well, he knows how to do it. It's definitely possible, and I, I honestly genuinely love just about every song or every song I've ever heard Tyler write. I hate to, yeah. hate to be able to put it like that, but yeah. like, I always tell fans and stuff when they're kind of ask about what it's like. It's like if I, was, if I wasn't playing bass, I'd be president of the fan club, man. Like I'm a big, big fan. <laughs> so it's like whenever I'm playing with Rod, you know, our thing is like, we're in a long-term relationship, man. Yeah. And like, you guys are married. Yeah, dude. And it's you like, you guys are married. We start, we're business partners and, and, um, and like, you know, it's part of my personality, but, like, I really try to find, like, objective truth in things and, like, especially music and groove. So we got this great material, and it's, like, 
I look at every night, like I'm really trying to bring a spirit in. It's like the kind of like this connection to like how people talk about gospel music or like bringing the Holy ghost into a room. Like, yeah, something bigger than what's going on just right here. Yeah. I think anybody who's like listened to music and had a profound experience knows, knows what it feels like whenever, um, it's like, it's like a sense of, um, everything's right, right then at that moment and everything that's happening is somehow you. Yeah. And, uh, so I, and I honestly think about it and I try to think about us as like scientists in some way, like, we have to be able to talk about the truth, what's going on. And cause there is a certain set of ingredients to make it good. But right. I also think of us as like witches around a cauldron yeah. trying to stir. It's something. not a hundred percent scientific. No, it's no. also sort of this intangible aspect of like, when we talk about rhythm section players and like, that's just intangible lock that works. Um, I think you two, you and Rodney Elkins are in a fortunate position because you've played together so long that the communication becomes almost like a body language of like, they can look at me and know that I'm here, I'm rushing, I'm, I'm, I'm dragging, I'm, uh, I'm not bringing the same amount of energy. You, when you have a relationship that lasts that long, I think the facial expressions and the body language become so nuanced and subtle that it does become sort of like an energy exchange, like a passage of like, uh, it's just not a tangible means of exp- uh communication that you guys have developed from playing how long together man i'm 32 right now i think the first time i ended up playing with rod i was probably 14 15 years old i think i might have been 14 yeah maybe 15 i think See, yeah, man, yeah. like that's not that common like i feel like that doesn't happen that often with musicians to play together that long i'm very fortunate in that regard man, yeah, man. absolutely and and we've grown together mm-hmm. and so many that's the exciting thing about being in a um long-term relationship is like a little well, musical marriage you could say yeah it's just like any relationship you know it, in your life i think there's a thing that's nice to understand about yourself and other people is that people change all the time and nobody changes ever and you know like it's like yourself like you're the same person you are but you're constantly changing at the same time yeah so. well you guys definitely represent um something i wish i had because i don't have any uh I don't have any homies that I've been playing music with for that long, but I've definitely noticed what it, how it rewards you to play together for a long time. You get a, there's a reward from sticking with that marriage and continuing to play together. You know what I mean? Yeah. I look at it as an investment, man. Like, right. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your songwriting. Cause I've heard your songs. I very much enjoy and adore your songs. Tell me a little bit about how you go about writing a song and, who your influences might might be and where do you get that itch to want to write a song i think a lot about writing a song for me is trying to find a way to express myself and i feel that way about you know developing on my instrument as well it's yeah. like there is a feeling of like having to get a release out you know like so yeah i think with songwriting i i really just try to you know find some that feeling of inspiration I think as the artist like you have a inward compass and you're kind of like the metal detector on the beach and you just you know going by what you think is nothing (laughs) here's some chords or whatever and then you hit like one thing and it's like a boop 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 and you know you try to come up with some melody you're blah 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 and you say some word right and you're like that that's something right that's exactly how it goes for a lot of people so like I, one I, word i think the pulling on a thread thing is kind of how i feel about it and you feel when there's a little resistance and you're like i want to i want to pull there a little more and right like, but i you know it's funny i think about it all the time but like i've not really reached my goal of like you know material that i love and i'm super proud of you know it's kind of a thing it's like i'm always i'm really trying to search for that so it's like you know i have these thoughts about it in ways that i try it but i don't really feel like i have any room to talk about it i don't know i think you're in the same place i don't think that ever goes away as far as you're working towards a thing and the goal post always gets moved you're always going to keep working towards you know i satisfaction with your work is a rare feeling you're always going to want to push it a little bit absolutely man there's this um, gospel song, actually Tyler turned me on to this collection of gospel funk, good God Border again funk, and there's one song on there called Same Thing It Took, and she says, the same thing it took to get the Holy Ghost is the same thing it takes to keep it, and it's like, I do think that there's this idea in life that like, 
I'm going to work really hard now so I can cruise here in about five, ten years. But, like, I don't really think there's ever any cruising thing. There's no cruising. So the more you can just enjoy working, you know, whatever yeah. you pull in the thread, you know, it's like, yeah. So you do get the Holy Ghost, but, like, you have to keep tending tending to it. You know what I mean? And, Absolutely. Uh, I'm in full agreement with you. And we're going to, con- as we uh, continue to bond with our musical lives and our musical journey, we're going to keep continue to pull the thread the thread never comes out of the wall baby absolutely it's good having you here craig hey pleasure to be here man thank you so much thank you